I'm going to start with uh, with Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Who's brought their Bibles? Amen. We need to bring our Bibles to church. We have no excuses with the technology we have nowadays. So Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Today we're going to look at the Holy Spirit because I've been looking at, uh, at the topics of discipleship. It's one of the things that we feel God is, is impressing on us to, uh, to really develop discipleship through this time. And if we look at Ephesians 4.11, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and a knowledge of God's Son that we will mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Ministry is not my responsibility, it is our responsibility. And so as we're, as we're talking about things today, I've been looking at, at the different things we could cover and praying into these. Every single thing we do as a Christian goes through the Holy Spirit. You want to study the Word of God? You need the Holy Spirit. You want to evangelize? you need the Holy Spirit. You want to worship, you need the Holy Spirit. You want to pray, you need the Holy Spirit. So we have to first have an understanding of the Holy Spirit's role in our lives. So if we look at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. It says, So they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of the Gadarenes. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out of the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrists and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to even subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves and in the hills, howling and cutting himself, cutting himself with sharp stones. Can you imagine if somebody came to you and said, we've got a problem this guy in our community is a problem. You're a Christian, can you pray for him? How many people would feel comfortable to walk up and take authority over the demonic spirit within him? How many people would freak out? There'd be a good number that would say, look, I'll go away and I'll pray about it. And all honest, there's a couple of honest people here, you'd freak out too. But we need to come to that place of knowing the Holy Spirit is the greater one in us. That the authority is in us. And we need to work on that, we need to pray into that, we need to study that and let that become a real, a real thing in our lives. And from verse 6, when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him and bowed low before him. With a shriek he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the Spirit, Come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us to those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. And Jesus was, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell, everything, tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim great things that Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed at what he'd told them. I think it's interesting from the day this guy gets set free, he doesn't enroll in the local Bible college. 
He doesn't go to school. He just goes out and starts telling people about Jesus. Telling them his story. Telling them that he was set free. Telling them about the power that exists in God. And as I was looking at this, I just had a real sense. God isn't interested in one-off encounters. God is interested in changing lives. Amen? God is interested in changing lives. Lives. And if we go across to John 11, 41 to 44, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. I tend to think in pictures. And I see a guy who's been buried. His hands and his feet are wrapped. And he comes out. I'm wondering whether he was hopping. Whether he was shuffling. You just imagine him sort of trying to come out like this. Or just you know, jumping to the door. But the look on people's face as this dead man surfaces. And time and time and time again... We read about the miracles that Jesus did, turning water into wine, speaking to a storm and it's stopping, telling the disciples where to catch fish. He feeds over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. He walks on water, heals the sick, raises the dead, cleanses the leper, casts out demons. And we might say, yeah, he was the son of God. But if we look at Acts 10.38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. And that's it's a, it's a scripture we need to understand. We need to really let that sink deep in our hearts. And we see this uh, comes to fruition in, in Matthew 3.16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came immediately out of the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Now there's three words in that verse I just want to quickly pay attention to. The first one is behold. It says, behold, the heavens were open. The word behold literally means you need to know this. There's an emphasis behind this. So the writer isn't just saying that, you know, a dove came down on Jesus, a great little story. He's saying you need to know the Holy Spirit came upon him. The next one is, he saw. Jesus saw the Spirit coming on him. But again, the original language says that he knew the Spirit had come upon him. It wasn't just, oh, maybe God's with me. And so often we, we hear people or we see people that live their life for, for now, they do things here, and it's almost like there's the, the natural life and the spiritual life. But if the Spirit of God is with you, and he is, and he'll never leave you or forsake you, then you are spirit and natural all at once. So you might go to a party and the Holy Spirit is there with you. You might go to a nightclub. You better believe that the Holy Spirit is there with you. You might be watching things on TV or on the internet. The Holy Spirit is watching those things with you. But you can also be laying hands on people and praying and the Holy Spirit is praying with you. He is an active part of your life all day every day and the last part was a lighting on him and there's a reference there to God descending like a dove and if I say you're as strong as an ox I'm not saying you're a four foot smelly beast I'm saying you're strong so when the Holy Spirit descended like a dove he didn't descend in bird form because the Bible very clearly says the Holy Spirit is a person and he is with you and he descended on Jesus but the the term there a lighting on him means to superimpose and we've looked at this before, but the Holy Spirit superimposed over Jesus at the time of his baptism. And in Acts 10.38, where it says God was with him, the indication is that it was more than one person. So when Jesus went to pray with somebody, the Holy Spirit was there with him. When you go to pray with someone, the Holy Spirit is there with you because he is also on you. The Holy Spirit was Jesus traveling companion, his ministry companion. 
So we might read that verse in this way. When he'd been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And you need to know this. The heavens were opened to him, and he knew the Spirit of God descended on him. And from that day onwards, the Holy Spirit went everywhere with him, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit brought was evidently all over him. So why do you think it says you need to know this? Who can venture a guess why we need to know the Holy Spirit was with Jesus? I look at that verse and I think if I'm reading that and, and I see other verses where, where we're told that we're going to do the same things Jesus did and more, I look at that verse and I think if the Holy Spirit was with Jesus and all the things that he did was because the Holy Spirit was with him, and then I look at the disciples and all the things they did because the Holy Spirit was with them, then why would I ever consider doing any part of my life without knowing the Holy Spirit is with me every step of the way? When you pray for each other around the table, the Holy Spirit is there with you. And as part of the conversation today, I want there to be a ministry time where you're praying with each other, where you're praying for needs. Feel free to pray for our nation again. Pray for each other's families. Pray for each other's children. Pray for each other's jobs. Because Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The same word upon is the same word when Jesus had the Holy Spirit come upon him. You have been superimposed by the Holy Spirit the day you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. So he doesn't just go with you on Sundays. He doesn't just stay at home relaxing and come with me suddenly when I have to go and pray with someone. He is on me. I'm a person who talks with my hands and, and I tend to move my hands a lot. So as I'm moving, you notice my shirt's moving with me. My shirt doesn't sit still and go, call me when you're ready. The Holy Spirit is on you. He is a part of you. He walks with you every single day. And John 14, 12 to 14, I've just said it before, most assuredly, not I think it might be, but most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and if we're going to do the same works he did, or greater works than he did, then speaking to a storm or speaking to coronavirus is not an unusual thing. Praying over somebody who is demon-possessed, strong enough to break chains, is not an unusual thing. It's our uncertainty that causes us to step back and say, oh, I'm not sure. And we need to come to that place where we're saying, Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to me. Reveal yourself to me. Let, let me have an encounter with you so that I know that there, there is something. Jesus knew the Holy Spirit was with him. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, I want to know that you're with me today. To have that reinforced. Because we are supposed to go out and lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We're supposed to be praying for the sick. We're supposed to be raising the dead. That would be fun, wouldn't it? We're supposed to be cleansing the lepers, casting out demons. This is a part of, of the calling that we have. And like I said earlier, when it comes to discipleship, everything revolves around the Holy Spirit. You are being trained and equipped for the work of the ministry. Think about what Jesus did. Think about how he changed lives. That's the thing that we're supposed to be doing. The equipping we have here, the equipping you have when you connect with people and study, is to go out and do the work of the ministry. So today in the conversations around the table, I want there to be a real grasp of the Holy Spirit is with me all the time. Not occasionally, not only on Sundays, not just when I pray. He is with me all the time. Where I go, he goes. When I pray, he prays. And I think that's a really powerful thing. If I lay hands on someone, I'm imparting the Holy Spirit who is on me. When I am praying, when I am speaking, he is speaking. So in my own strength, I can't heal anybody. But through the power of the Holy Spirit who is already on me, all sorts of miracles can happen. All sorts of miracles can happen as you do that. Let your conversation 
be around that, understanding the Holy Spirit is with you. And I want there to be this morning a prayer time as well. And I'm going to ask the deacons to, to hand out communion uh, right at the start as we go into the conversation now. And as a part of your time, have communion together. Again, I'm in partnership with God. I am bringing God into everything I am doing. How many people had communion several times at least this week? It's a good thing to practice. Keep doing that. Keep, keep reinforcing the fact that God is with you every day, that you are in partnership with him every day. Let the time of conversation be, be wholesome. Let it be a time where you are stirred up, where you are equipped, where you are praying for people. And when you pray for each other, keep in mind that when you're praying, the Holy Spirit is praying. And when you do this as a table, some really powerful things can happen. So, Lord, I just thank you for this time we have. I ask that these times of conversation, Lord, that you just really strengthen this time, strengthen our conversation, strengthen our understanding of you. Lord, we release this time into your hands, and we thank you that you are here, and we acknowledge that now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Enjoy the conversation. We'll catch up later. Who's gotten something out of today's uh, time around the tables? Is there anybody who's got anything they'd like to share? I can bring the microphone to you, so don't feel you have to run up the front. But just to briefly share about what God's been doing in your life over the last few weeks. Fairly quickly too, nothing too long. No one's game. <laughs> yes, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the healing power that you've given to my body, Lord and that you've saved my butt once again in 16 months the second time lord and the healing is taking place very nicely so i thank you and praise you for that dear father in jesus precious name amen. amen it's good to see what god's doing in lyle's life in the way of healing it's been a a process but a wonderful thing to see just one more anybody else got anything they'd like to share Okay, we're just going to pray. I just want to encourage you, feel free to continue around the table. Uh, continue praying with people if you need to. Tea and coffee will still be on. The cafe is now closed, but you can still get a hot drink if you want to continue. Lord, we want to thank you for today. We want to thank you that, Father, you, you are with us by your Spirit all day, every day, that you never leave us or forsake us. And we are so blessed, Father, with everything that you have done for us. Father, we acknowledge you as our Lord, as our Saviour. We pray your blessing on us as we go from here today, Father. Use us to expand the work of your kingdom. Use us to glorify your name. And we thank you again for all you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful week.